Hello everyone, welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo Dawood, and today's special guest is Richard Duncan. Richard is an author and chief economist at Black Horse Asset Management. Richard's latest book is called The New Depression, The Breakdown of the Paper Money Economy. Richard, thank you for joining us. Um, in today's economy, a lot of people are, are making their big purchases, whether the government or people on Main Street using credit, rather than what we had 50 years ago, where people save their money, they start a business, and then they, you know, created wealth, and that's how the economy uh, functioned back then. Now we have an economy where government uh, borrowed beyond their means. And also, a lot of people on Main Street have borrowed beyond their mean as well. How did we get to this stage? I think the the nature of our economic system began to change in 1968. That was when the United States stopped backing dollars with gold. Up until that time, there was a law that required the Fed to maintain at least 25% gold backing for all of the dollars that it issued. But in 1968, Congress changed that law at President Johnson's request. And the the real significance of that is once we stopped backing dollars with gold, that removed all constraints on how much credit could be created. And what we've seen since then is that total credit in the United States has absolutely exploded. Total credit first went through $1 trillion in the U.S. in 1964. And then over the, the next 43 years, it expanded 50 times from $1 trillion to $50 trillion by 2007. And so that, that explosion of credit really created our world. It, it made us all much more material, materially prosperous than we would have been otherwise. But the problem now is it seems that the private sector is incapable of repaying the debt that it has already. And it seems to be a very real danger that this explosion of credit is now going to lead to a collapse uh, and perhaps a a new Great Depression. And that's what I wondered when we got off the gold standard. I wonder what the politicians and the economists back then thought what would happen to the economy. Do they think it will become a utopia society where everything will be fine and there will be no uh, recession? Because right because if you look at what they've done since uh, they got off the gold standard, we have a lot more boom and bust cycle in, in the U.S. economy. If you think about it, we had the 1987 crash, dot-com bubble crash, the housing crash, and right now we have a stock market and bond bubble that is brewing right now. Do you, do you think they uh, thought about the uh, outcome of what would happen? No, I don't think the politicians, I don't think the president's, for instance, we're thinking beyond the next election. You can see by reading about President Johnson and President Nixon that they were focused on on the next election. They didn't know very much about economics. They didn't care. They wanted to be reelected. And in order to get reelected, they wanted to rev up the economy. And in order to do that, they needed to break the link between dollars and gold because the U.S. just didn't have enough gold reserves left to allow the money supply to keep expanding at the rate that those politicians desired. And that's a great point. And I'm not in favor of returning to the gold standard, but I do like the idea of having compete, competing currency in an open market. Uh, would you be open to this, that type of uh, monetary system in the economy where people can choose whatever currency they want to use, whether it's Bitcoin, gold, silver, or even the U.S. dollar? It's not something I've given a lot of thought to, but my initial reaction would be, would be no, because I think if there's, if there's no control over money creation and anyone can issue any money that they want, this is just going to lead to even greater bubbles forming and even greater boom and bust cycles. So I think we've got plenty of money as it is already. And... Uh, of course, anyone can buy gold now if they want to, and that there's also all the other foreign currencies available for people to buy if they if they really want to buy something other than dollars. So I I think we have plenty of types of money as it is. So if you were uh, a politician and you wanted to fix the 
monetary system in the United States, what would you do? Uh, would you try to um, have, say, the free market control the money supply, or would you try something different? I don't think there is any easy way to fix the system now. After a four and a half decade, $50 trillion expansion of credit, I don't think there's any way to, to go back to any sort of gold standard. I, You started out our conversation by discussing the, the, the way people now charge everything on credit. What I've seen is that going back to almost all the way back to World War II, credit growth now drives economic growth. And every time that credit grows by less than 2%, going back to 1952, every time credit grew by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, we had a recession. And the recession didn't end until we had another very big surge of credit expansion. So now this system is no longer driven in the same way that capitalism was. Capitalism was driven, the growth dynamic there worked like this. Businessmen would invest, some of them would make a profit, they would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat the process. So the growth dynamic was driven by investment savings, investment savings. That's how capitalism created economic growth. But our system hasn't worked like that for decades. The way the system works now is the growth dynamic is driven by credit creation and consumption and more credit creation and more consumption. And that's created extremely rapid economic growth over the last several decades. But the danger is that, is that this new system, I call it creditism, is going to break down now because the credit can't be repaid. So my point is, I think we have a different kind of economic system than we used to have. And we need to understand how our economic system works and because there's no going back to the old system now. So we need to understand not only the dangers inherent within creditism, but also perhaps we need to explore the opportunities that may exist within this new economic system. And if you look at the way the GDP is uh, has been growing, most of the growth has been come from government spending. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's right. We are on we are on government life support since 2008. The government's budget deficits have amounted in total to something like $6 trillion now. Without that expansion of government debt and government large budget deficits, we would have collapsed into a new Great Depression. There's no doubt about it. So let's uh, look at the broader scope and look at uh, China and how their economy functions. Uh, China is an industrial-based economy rather than uh, a consumer consumption credit-based economy like the U.S. What do you think? Do you think China will eventually evolve into a credit consumer-based economy like the U.S., or do you think it will stay on course and continue to dominate uh, the global economy with its uh, industrial and manufacturing base? Well, so China was transformed by its trade surplus with the, with the U.S. In, in 1990, China didn't have a trade surplus, and it still looked like it did under Chairman Mao. But now China's trade surplus with the U.S. is roughly $330 billion a year. And that's the thing that's transformed China. They've been able to grow their industrial production very rapidly, grow their investment and and fixed capital very rapidly because they've been able to sell the, the goods they produce to the United States on credit, I might add. The United States has been financing these acquisitions on credit. But, but now that the U.S. is in crisis, this is creating a very dire environment for China. And when the crisis in the U.S. started in 2008, well, the next year, U.S. imports from China dropped for the first time in, in several decades, and that created a very significant crisis for China right then. And the Chinese policymakers responded to that 
by allowing the Chinese banks to grow total bank loans in China by 60% over the next two years. So total bank loans in China grew by 60% in just 24 months during roughly, say, 2009, 2010. And that's created, a, a, of course, it created a surge in demand in China. You know, just imagine what would happen to the U.S. economy if total bank loans grew by 60% in two years. Property prices would skyrocket, everybody would have a job, and everyone would feel very good about themselves. But then three or four years down the road, those bank loans wouldn't be repaid. There would be a systemic banking crisis, and the government would have to intervene to bail out the depositors of the bankrupt banks. And that's more or less where China is now. China, because its exports are no longer growing and driving the economy, as they've done for decades, China is already depending very, very heavily on very rapid credit expansion now, so rapid that um, there are great concerns that this is leading to an enormous economic bubble, that this may in fact be the blow-off stages of China's great economic bubble. And it, there's a risk that it will, it will pop with very dire consequences for, for the Chinese economy and, and, for that matter, for the global economy. And when you talk about the uh, explosion in the uh, bank lending, you're also talking about uh, an increase in the money velocity as well, which also can flame higher inflation in the economy. So I think that's why also we're seeing higher inflation in countries like India and China because of the increase in money velocity rather than, you know, in the U.S., the money velocity is not very high right now and that's why we don't we're not seeing that high hyper or high inflation or hyperinflation that people are predicting right now. Well I think globally one of the main explanations for why that, that's the case is because first of all globalization is very, very deflationary. And that's because because of globalization, it's no longer necessary for a company to hire a worker in Michigan and pay that person $200 a day to build a car. They can now hire someone in China to do the same job for $10 a day, or someone in India for $5 a day. And that means that the cost of hiring your next worker, or in other words, the marginal cost of labor for hiring your next worker, has dropped more than 90%. So nothing like this has ever occurred in history before. This is putting extreme downward pressure on wages uh, in the West is, and is putting extreme downward pressure on prices of all manufactured goods. So that's an extremely deflationary force, and that's offsetting the inflationary pressures that would normally accompany a surge in credit expansion and paper money creation. Were it not for globalization, we would have had very high rates of inflation in the United States a long time ago. And also because the United States is a world reserve currency, the U.S. is able to export a lot of their inflation to other countries like China, um, India, and all, and other trading partners that they have as well due, due to the globalization that you're talking about. Well, that's right. When the, when the Fed creates a lot of paper money, as it has been doing, one of the effects of that was to push up global food prices, particularly during the second round of quantitative easing. Global food prices spiked very sharply, and I believe that contributed to the, the uprisings across North Africa and around the Middle East. In other words, the Arab Spring was, the fuse was lit by Ben Bernanke and the, and the printing presses at the Fed. So that's how the U.S. exports inflation. But it's been interesting. We should never forget that prices are affected by a number of factors, and one of the most important of which, of course, is supply and demand. So what we have seen is that the very high food prices of a couple of years ago has led to farmers planting more crops than ever, and now we're seeing record harvest in many cases, and that's pushing down food prices again, despite the fact that quantitative easing is now 
creating even more money than before. So there's been a supply response in, in response to the higher prices. And that's not only true for food, but we're also seeing that, for instance, with certainly with oil and even copper now. And you made a great point there. And I want to shift gears here and talk about the inflation-deflation debate that's been ongoing pretty much since the 2009 crisis uh, or 2008 crisis and the Federal Reserve started to roll out the QE programs. Now, there's a lot of inflationists out there and deflationists out there, and, and they both make good arguments. Um, there's also people out there that's arguing that we have both inflation and deflation right now, where we have certain assets that are inflating in prices, such as commodities, such as oil, gold, silver. And there's also other goods that you know, are deflating in price because of uh, the economy that we have right now, and there's no demand. And a good example of that is electronics. Uh, when electro new electronic comes out, they are high in prices, and after a while, it deflates. So, what's your position on that? Do you think we have inflation or deflation? And based on what I've heard from you in, in this podcast, it sounds like uh, you, we think you think we have deflation. Is that correct? Well, I think it's useful to divide inflation into three different categories. There's the normal kind of inflation that we usually think about at the consumer price level, the CPI inflation. And there, there's, there's, it's very low. The recent numbers have all been significantly below 2% year-on-year -year increase in core inflation. And the explanation for that is, as I was just saying, globalization is driving down wages and, and the cost of manufactured goods. But the second kind of inflation is commodity price inflation. And there, we've discussed that a bit already. We did have a spike in commodity prices, especially during the second round of quantitative easing, but, but now they're moving back down despite the third round of quantitative easing being in full force. And that's, uh, again, as I said, it's because of the supply response to the very high prices. But the third category of inflation is asset price inflation. And here, we've had very significant asset price inflation, particularly in the stock market and with bonds. And over the last six months or so, even the property market in the U.S. is now up almost 13% year on year. And so this is a direct result of the Fed's quantitative easing policy. As you know, the Fed's now creating $85 billion every month and using it to buy assets and but they're using it to buy government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. So that pushes up the price of the bonds and drives down their yields, or in other words, drives down interest rates. But also it forces the people that they buy the bonds from to buy something else, like stocks. And so that pushes up the stock market. So the goal of quantitative easing is to create asset price inflation and so that the Americans will feel richer and go out and spend more money and drive the economy, even though median, the median wage in the U.S. Is, is being driven down as a result of globalization. So it's the, it's the Fed's policy to create asset price inflation. So I think it's important to look at each of those categories of inflation rather than generalizing. But now, more broadly, after a four and a half decades and a 50-fold expansion of credit, I think we have a very large global credit bubble, and looking ahead five to ten years, it's not certain which way it's going to play out. It depends on, we have to understand that the government is now directing our economy, but we don't know who the government will be run by in five or ten years. Taking extreme examples, if we had the, say, the Tea Party takes over government in the United States and they ban the Fed and they balance the budget, then we would definitely have extreme deflation. There would be a deflationary depression. On the other hand, let's say, using, a, again, an extreme example, let's say Ben Bernanke is elected president, and, and he decides to start printing a trillion dollars every month. Well, then in that case, we would end up with very high rates of inflation or hyperinflation. So it's, it's uncertain which way it will go. But the important thing to understand is that we, we have a very large 
credit bubble. And if it is allowed to deflate, the natural tendency is for it to deflate and for there to be deep deflation. It's only the government intervention that's keeping this credit bubble inflated. And the question is, is, are they going to overinflate it and lead to high rates of inflation? But if left to any sort of process of supply and demand or laissez-faire, we would have extreme deflation and depression. But, but that's not going to occur because the government is going to continue to intervene. And it's safe to say that the government had mandatory policy to create inflation and to avoid deflation. And if you look at it in the history, all the inflation that happened in the past is all due to government intervention. I don't think it ever ha happened due to free market or capitalism, because normally in free market and capitalism we have a, a lot of uh, deflation where and a lot of uh, adjustment to prices and wages according to what's going on to the economy. And going back to your point about uh, deflation, a lot of Austrian economists out there that are arguing that if we have deflation, that would be the best cure uh, for the diseases that's going on in this economy because what this economy needs right now is the people to start saving their money so that it'll uh, create uh, wealth and capital, and so and then people start uh, open up businesses, and which will um, create uh, more wealth and lead to more jobs, and it, then the economy will start to expand. Uh, do you buy that argument from the Austrian circle? Well, I I certainly believe the Austrian economists are right in in understanding that credit creates an artificial boom. And that the day normally arrives, always arrives, when the credit can't be repaid and the boom turns into a bust. So their views on credit and the role that credit plays in creating these boom and bust cycles, I believe that's exactly right. But where I differ from the Austrian economists now is my concern, my fear, is that after a four and a half decade long $50 trillion expansion of credit, that if we allow credit to contract now, and if we allow this deflation to take place, it's not just going to be a matter of a couple of years and everything's going to go back to normal and we'll all be happy and return to some sort of laissez-faire Garden of Eden. No, we've had a four and a half decade global boom. If we allow this boom to bust now, the depression is going to be so severe and so traumatic that the banking system will be wiped out and everyone's savings will be destroyed it will be a replay at least as bad as the 1930s and perhaps followed by a, a 1940s scenario as well. So if the bubble pops now, if we allow this massive global credit bubble to pop, I don't think anyone alive today will live long enough to see the recovery. So it's not just going to be a matter of a one or two year downturn and everything, you know, painful for a couple of years and then everything's going to be great again. No, this is going to be a multi-generation depression and therefore we can't allow this credit bubble to pop so long as there's any possible other alternative. So in your book, The New Depression, uh, you, talk, you talked about uh, your solution uh, to the problem that we have in the economy. And one of, one of your solution is to have the government uh, rather invest uh, in infrastructure. Um, they invest in new technologies and new industries to spur growth. Uh, if you don't mind, could you uh, elaborate on, on that solution? Yes. I, as I said, I think it's crucial that we understand that we have a different kind of economic system that, than we're used to. This isn't capitalism. We're not going back to capitalism. Sad though that may be to many people, that's just, that's just the reality of it. The government more or less took over the economy in World War II, and we've been directed by government spending ever since that time. There's no, there's no returning to any sort of 19th century version of capitalism. Sorry about that, but that's just the reality. So capitalism, you know, child, children were working in, in the coal mines, and you know, people frequently worked for 12-hour days at subsistence wages. So it, it wasn't, everything about capitalism was not ideal. Let's not forget that. But so anyway, that's not the kind of economic system we've had now for decades, and we're not going back to it. 
no matter how much many people would like that to occur. So that's just the reality of it. I mean, you know, don't shoot the messenger, but here we are. This is not capitalism. The government directs the economy. And so now we have had this 50-year credit boom. And the government government's going to continue directing the economy because if they don't, they understand we're going to collapse into a, a horrible, catastrophic, global Great Depression. So I think we can look toward Japan and see how this is going to play out. Japan's bubble popped 23 years ago, and the Japanese, in order to prevent a depression there, have ex expanded Japanese government debt from 60% of GDP in 1990. It's now 250% of GDP in Japan. And despite these very high levels of government debt, the Japanese have just elected a new prime minister because he promised to expand the government debt even further and he promised to make the central bank print even more paper money. And that's what they have been doing since he's been elected. So that tells us that a democracy will not tolerate austerity for very long. So the reality is, is the U.S. government is going to continue to spend massive amounts of money to, to keep the economy from collapsing into a depression. That is the reality. Now, the only question is, how are they going to spend that money? Are they going to spend it wastefully, the way that Japan has done, and the way that they are currently spending it for the most part? They say Japan wasted all of that money building bridges to nowhere and paving the Japanese countryside with cement just to keep people employed. Well, in the U.S., the government's spending too much money on consumption and too much money on war. So they can continue doing this. U.S. government debt is only 100% of GDP. Japanese government debts 250% of GDP. And by the way, the Japanese government bond yield, it's not high. It's extremely low. It's 60 basis points. The Japanese government can borrow money at an annual rate of less than 1%. So in the U.S., we need to learn from Japan's experience and not waste all of the money that the government's going to spend uh, unproductively. What I'd like to see is the government actually invest this money that it's going to spend anyway. Rather than wasting it, let's invest it in transformative new industries and technologies. So over the next 10 years, for instance, I'd like to see the government invest a trillion dollars in solar energy, a trillion dollars in genetic engineering, a trillion dollars in biotech, and a trillion dollars in nanotech. And if they did that, 10 years from now, we, the United States, would have an absolutely unassailable lead in these 21st century industries. And these investments would be enormously profitable, so profitable that they would not only pay back the cost of the investment, they would pay it back many times over. Just imagine, 10 years from now, you know, and by the way, I'm not talking about investing in solar panel companies like Solyndra. What you can do with a trillion dollars over 10 years, you can pave Nevada, which is already owned by the government, with a million or five million solar panels, whatever it takes, and then build a grid coast to coast to transmit that electricity on and transition the automobile industry from being oil burning to electric burning. And 10 years from now, we would have free, eternal, limitless energy that the government could tax and pay for Medicare and Social Security for the next 10,000 years. So if we understand the nature of our new economic system, creditism, and use it sensibly, then there are immense opportunities. We don't have to collapse into a new depression. Sadly, that's not likely to happen. The most likely scenario is that we will do what Japan has done and what we're currently doing, just continue to waste the money and end up maybe 10 to 15 years out in some sort of new Great Depression. Now, one of the common uh, feedback I've heard regarding your solution is that government is not good at allocating resources. And if you look at what they've done in the past, you mentioned their investment in the solar industry that didn't go well. but uh, And then... If you think about, you know, they took over General Motors, and General Motors is not really performing 
outperforming their com- their competition uh, right now. They probably never will. Um, and the private industry is able to do with their investment. Do you are you confident that they can replicate what the private uh, enterprise can do in terms of creating wealth and investments? Well, let's not forget that General Motors was a private company before it went bankrupt and had to be saved by the government, as were all the banks that had that failed and had to be saved by the government. And so let me give you a few examples of where government has invested sex- successfully. First, consider the, the Manhattan Project. In World War II, the government took all the geniuses it could find and put them together in, in New Mexico and threw unlimited amounts of money at them. And within a very short period of time, that government investment resulted in the weapon that won the war in the Pacific, the nuclear bomb. Next, think about Apollo. The Apollo space program, in large part, was designed to develop missile technology to intimidate the Russians, but it sent a man to the moon. We would still be nowhere near the moon had this been left to the private sector, I'm sorry to say. And the result of that government investment in those technologies resulted in incredible spin-offs that have benefited the economy and the private sector. Next, think about the interstate highway system. That was built by the government. Or more broadly, uh, the U.S. military. Because the U.S. government invests more in the U.S. military than the rest of the world combined, that government investment in the military has given the United States global military dominance. So what I'm suggesting is that we take this investment strategy and expand it not only from the military, but also into industry and into power generation. And if we do, we'll have global dominance in those areas as well. Well, Richard, I would like to thank you for your time. And before we let you go, uh, you just recently wrote out a video newsletter on your website called uh, Macro Watch. So what should people expect from your uh, new video newsletter? And tell us uh, what kind of service you will be providing as well. Okay, well, thanks for mentioning that. Our conversation this morning has turned a, a, bit, a little bit political, I think. Uh, my newsletter is much more focused on, on it, understanding the macro economy. It's called Macro Watch, and it's presented in a video format. So it's, it's essentially me doing PowerPoint presentations. Now, my belief is that in this new age of fiat money, that the economy doesn't work the way it used to. Now, credit growth drives economic growth, and liquidity determines the direction that asset prices will move. And the government does everything it can to control both credit growth and liquidity. So in my newsletter, MacroWatch, it, it, it analyzes trends in credit growth, liquidity, and government policy in order to anticipate how those things will impact asset prices and economic growth going forward. So there's, I developed something I call the liquidity gauge, which is very useful in understanding whether asset prices are likely to inflate or deflate. And this you can find on my, my website, richardduncaneconomics.com. It's called MacroWatch. I hope you'll check it out. And yeah, and a, and a video newsletter is a great idea because a lot of people uh, nowadays are preferring to watch video or listen to an audio or podcast rather than read long text or long or a long book or n- long novel. So yeah, I think your uh, video newsletter is a great idea, and I hope people will check that out as well. Well, Richard, uh, thank you for joining us for Wall Street from Adri podcast, and I hope you could come back again. Okay, Mo, thank you for inviting me. I'd be glad to come back.